नहीं बाबू बस देश को छूने आए वाह रोंगड़े खड़े हो गए दैट मीन्स दैट 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 स्टेटमेंट सम्स इट ऑल अप दैट्स व्हाट इट्स अबाउट दैट वी गो देयर एज अ सॉवरेन पीस एज अ पीस ऑफ सॉवरेन इंडियन टेरिटरी एंड ऑल दैट चैप वांटेड टू डू वाज टू कम एंड टच हिज नेशन ऑल द सोफिस्टिकेशन इन आवर लाइफ इन आवर लाइफ वैनिश्ड ओवर्स इन वन गो ओके so extrication options are important whether they occur in obscun which uh, happened off lebanon or they occur more recently as in uh, march april of this year in terms of libya on the eastern flank as well look at malaysia and the number of indians that we have over there it's quite substantial that brings me to the third and last <coughs> element of the <clears throat> geostrat the maritime security of india that is the geo strategies of other maritime powers with that of india and this is where think tanks actually come into their own we define geo strategy quite happily lifting it from the definition by the chinese uh, scholar senior captain shu chi who said that geo strategy is a country's effort in the world arena to exploit its geographic location and use geographic orientation to pursue and safeguard its national interests what does that mean it means that every nation has two elements to it one is ge geography which is the fixed position we are india yeah. we are we are the land of magic we can do anything we can uh, but something we cannot we cannot change geography if we could i would have taken pakistan and put it in central idaho <laughs> I'm not anything against Central Idaho, but for <laughs> but we cannot, and therefore we must deal with them. Geography is fixed. The other is geographic orientation, which is a variable factor, and which is also called the country's strategic culture. This requires a scholarship, a deep study of history, and the lessons drawn from historical experience. and the ability to identify and differentiate between threats interests and risks i'm sorry ladies and gentlemen just one second this admiral shankar's mobile phone it's very expensive what if i was to leave it here and say okay let's go and have tea admiral shankar is going to say excuse me bilu can i get my phone back okay you know will you keep it okay can you put it in your briefcase all right is there is it okay to have uh, somebody guarding it can we lock the room in other words he's going to display some change of behavior and yet if there are 70 people in this audience or 60 people in this audience not one of us has said have threatened him with that a phone rakhe to dekh kaise gayab hota hai none of us there is no threat to the phone and yet he will exhibit behavior seeking to protect it why because it is an interest and that is the difference ladies and gentlemen between an interest and a threat armies worry about threats navies worry about interests navies will seek to protect promote and preserve interests even when there's no threat on it and so you must not get carried away with this business of threat all the time the essence of geo strategy ladies and gentlemen is where one stands on any given subject depends upon where one sits as far as india is concerned she sits at the junction of the busy international shipping lane that criss cross the indian ocean and this determines much of our security viewpoint um pk has already said that you know over 120000 ships transit this ocean every year The Strait of Malacca accounts for 70,000, but the Strait of Bab el-Mandeb also accounts for 22,000 ships in a year. These are not small numbers. And yet, all this is subsumed in one feature. That means all our geostrategic thinking is being subsumed in this oxymoronic state that we find ourselves in of constant change. Just like uh, somebody said that he was in naval intelligence. It's a pretty good oxymoron by itself. <laughs> Okay, I better not uh, deprecate any further. Uh, change, change is upon us. Almost all the familiar landmarks of our security establishment and our thought processes are being buffeted or even swept away by strong winds of change. 
And perhaps the most ominous of these is the rise of the non-state malevolent actor. And even more ominously, the coalescing of the state with the non-state to produce the malevolent state-sponsored non-state actor. And this gentleman and his ilk lie at the heart of our current security dilemma based upon the memories we have of the many depredations they visited upon us. What should we do? Should we tackle the source or should we worry about the people? We have as many opinions about this as there are people. And yet when we talk about Pakistan, we need to consider a few facts about them. Today, the jihad, those, those jihadi chicken that Pakistan let fly have come home to roost. But this is cold comfort to us. As Pakistan destabilizes, not only in Fata and the Northwest Frontier Province, but in Punjab, Balochistan, and Sindh, most importantly for us, Sindh, we are increasingly concerned about what is happening in this area. This is a picture of PNS Mehran, which you're all familiar with. And so we look and we concern ourselves and we write dreams of paper and brilliant analysis. And, but then we look at ourselves. This is a picture of INS Shikra right here in Mumbai, Kulaba. That is Sundar Nagar. That is Azad Nagar. They are slums. Let me show you. This is a seeking helicopter. The cost of a seeking helicopter is approximately 200 crores. That is where, this is the distance from where a chap here, if this helicopter had its rotors running, a person here could throw a stone and have a 200 crore wipe off. You know how many, how many hearts you would have to break to come up with 200 crores? One, not a Molotov cocktail either, one stone. That's all. And therefore, when we discuss issues of security, we as a Navy must draw lessons from Mehran and concern ourselves with issues like this. And yet, while media coverage is extensive in many areas, this, there is strong silence. Let me come back to Pakistan and tell you about Gwadar. By itself, we believe that a strong Pakistan, stable, secure, economically well-developed is in our interest because instability does not understand borders. And therefore, for itself, we couldn't care less what happens in Gwadar. But the fact that there is substantial Chinese presence here worries us. There are many fanciful theories. One I'm going to show you two slides about. One lot of people say that this is the Gwadar Kujra Pass oil pipeline. It will run all the way like this. People who say this instantly get media attention because it's so sexy. While India was sleeping, those chairs managed, you know, China overtook us strategically. It's so, it's so newsworthy. Then you get all this cover also. So it all sounds very. It's like a magician. He's got patter and you're being perhaps taken in. So you need to worry about the fact that if these fanciful, um, let me explain this a little bit. This is, all these solid lines are projections <coughs> in the future, okay? This is the future projected oil pipeline from Karachi and this one is the future projected pipeline which will run connecting water to the Central Asian pipelines. Let me tell you about pipelines. Gas pipelines and oil pipelines differ entirely. The economics of gas movement and the economics of oil movement in a pipeline are totally different. We as a country have many think tanks. Not one of them has produced a seminal study on the economics of oil pipelines, which, which can either support or debunk the thought processes that are now jumping out of the box because there's nobody to challenge them. Nobody is able to tell us if the longest pipelines in the, on the planet currently extend up to about 4,000 kilometers and that too with seven pumping stations all on flat land 
how on earth are you going to get this sort of thing going? But media, it's too tempting. The sub-editor will kiss you on both cheeks. So we'll publish. As far as the Navy is concerned, we feel strongly that Pakistan's continental mindset binds it and it, so it prevents Pakistan from actually having a true maritime strategy at all. And therefore, Pakistan functions pretty much as a proxy player to that other great power which is emerging, and that is China. Let me talk to you a few minutes about China. With China, we need to concern ourselves with energy above all things. This slide shows you the fact that the source, the competition for all the points of energy within the energy basket of both countries, China and India, both have a predominance of coal, both are net importers, sources of, coal, of import are the same. In terms of petroleum, there is huge deficit, sources of petroleum are the same. In Hyderabad, India is a lower riparian state, you've been reading about about this in the papers where breathless anecdotes are written about Brahmaputra being damned. Actually, China was damned, Brahmaputra doesn't matter to us at all. Nothing will happen to India. But Bangladesh, lots of bad things will happen to Bangladesh. And then what happens to Bangladesh will start affecting us. Nuclear power, if, if there's a Q&A session, I will go into this. Um, but again, sources of import, the same. China, too, needs to pick up uranium all over the place. Take a look at this slide. The year is 1983, 85. China is East Asia's largest exporter of oil. Eight years later, it is 1993, China becomes a net importer. Ten years down the line, it is 2003, China is the second largest importer of oil on the planet. India is doing not, not much better. Now, China's investments, therefore, in Africa, in general, and in Angola in particular. Oil imports from Africa already account for 27% of Chinese overall oil imports. Let me tell you about oil imports. There are two types of oil imports, equity oil and real oil. Everybody understands equity oil. Real oil means physically oil is going from that country or that location to yours. Angolan oil is physical. This is Angola. Yes. Today, just today, we dealt at some length in the morning with the Namibian delegation. Why are we talking to Namib Namibia? Because Nam Namibia is here. And therefore, we need, as uh, Vicky said, we are doing things. We are also playing games. We are also playing our cards. Hold on to that thought for a few minutes. So Angola is arguably China's largest supplier of crude oil since 2007 for a single country. <coughs> that oil moves around the Cape of Good Hope and it doesn't go up and down through the Strait of Malacca, it goes through Lombok. It's very interesting oil. We develop a lot of thought on how this oil is moving, who's moving it. We spend huge amounts of resources in doing this. That is why we engage our government to plead with them to say, let us develop IPSA, India, Brazil, South Africa relationships. Because that gives us legitimacy to be operating around the Cape of Good Hope. That's what it's about. <clears throat> the difference between India and China, we live in the Indian Ocean. We exist here, China doesn't. And yet, for China, all her oil must move either from or through the Indian Ocean. And therefore, it must move through those choke points of Malacca, Sunda, and Lombok. And they are critical choke points to us, even as a military, nothing whatsoever to do with the MEA at this point in time. Now, when uh, the person <coughs> formulated the string of pearl strategic construct, whether it was based on uh, Judy McDonald's uh, necklace or not, um, it instantly caught the attention of the world. And Chinese have been, from that day to now, saying, we don't have a strategy like this. Just like India has been pointing out for years, we don't have a cold start doctrine. This is what Pakistan thinks that India has. Since, uh, you know, we don't tell you what we think, so you have no option but to take their thought. <laughs> so, string of pearls. One minute on 
the difference between a, geo, a maritime strategy and a continental one. Just one minute. If you take a stone and you throw it in water, you will have ripples. Mera ghar. Mera ila. Mera gaon. Meri tehsi. Mera asol. This is continental. That means if you take a single line and join all the points of interest, and if they end up encircling a core land area, then that is a continental strategy, no matter how far away you are. If, on the other hand, you can take points of interest, and they connect to one another, but they need not, and they do not actually encircle your land area, then you have a maritime strategy. The only way you can make it connect is when you go pretty much around the world. That is why maritime strategies concern themselves with very large oceanic and land spaces. So, two minutes more. String, pearls. Woody Island in the parasol, pearl. <coughs> Spratleys, pearl. Cambodia, Thailand, Isthmus of Kra, Sitwe. Bangladesh, Chittagong Port, Cambodia, Hamban Tota. Where do we go? Perth. Perth! Of course, Perth. Chinese investments in mining in Australia are now frightening on the, east, on the uh, west coast of Australia. That's where the uranium is. Sudan, Tanzania, Comoros, Seychelles, Mozambique, South Africa, again. Uh, of course, Wada, all these are pearls. And they don't connect to circle China. They circle some other country. There are five reasons for this. One is the unavoidable and ever-increasing offtake from high-capacity sources of oil and gas, the strategic need to avoid placing all your energy eggs in a single basket, the consequent need to ensure economic development and hence domestic stability, the need to ensure the security of China's oceanic transportation of energy and the need to reduce the vulnerabilities in the choke points of the Indian Ocean. That's what the string of pearls is driven by. These are the five points. And so, when China operates their national strategic interests, this is what it looks like. Pretty frightening. As the geographic competition space between India and China coincides in the Indian Ocean, ladies and gentlemen, there is a significant risk of competition transforming into conflict. This is the slide we show. Watch. This is China and its proxy player, India. You ever played bridge? Anybody plays bridge? Played in the distant halcyon days of youth? Played bridge? In bridge you have that, you know, north and south. So ladies and gentlemen, I put to you, east and west have played. Now the questions to be asked are this. What are India's hands? What are India's cards? And how are they being played? Who is, who is north? And most importantly, who's the dummy? These are questions that engage us, as indeed they engage the strategic community at large, and they are questions that need to be asked. I'm not going to show you them, because those are only our thoughts. You need to hear other thoughts. The only way we handle things in our risk assessment, in our uh, risk mitigation strategy, is through constructive engagement. We play, China plays a game at a strategic table, the India, Indian government tends to play at the level of operational art. We don't, we don't play strategic games very well. We play much more focused games at the level of operational art because we have uh, uh, cards to play that game. So we engage other navies so that we can gain and share operational and doctrinal expertise, transformational experiences, best practices, interoperability issues, and the generation of maritime domain awareness, which is the biggest we don't know what to do in many cases because we don't know who's there. We're like, we're like, sometimes we're like people who are blind. 
I don't have time, other than I told you a really good story about this blind thing. I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, Why don't you close on that story, Bill? That's a good idea. Just let me finish with this. Okay, I'll tell you the story after this. Uh, we believe that we must engage all countries on both ends of the axis, both with those countries who are, not only those countries who are superior to us, but even those countries for whom our engagement builds capacity and enhances capability. Generally, at the last point I wanted to make was that we operate along all sides of the pyramid of roles for the Navy. It is our belief that in the next 10 years, the avoidance of open military conflict will be a national priority. For that same reason, preparedness for all eventualities ranging from economic competition to military conflict will be a complementary priority. We believe that the Navy will need to constructively contribute and meaningfully to this process, and that is what will underscore our relevance in times of peace, tension, and conflict. And therefore, we go by this particular statement, aut concilio, aut ense, which means that either by meeting or by sword, we will seek to have relevance and maintain relevance across the entire spectrum of conflict. And with that breathless gallop, I surrender to Commodore Vasco. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. What I would call as a tour de force by Admiral Belu Chauhan, and uh, a very wide range has been covered. I had two options. You know, one is to offer the equivalent of uh, critique and be a discussant. Dhawal suggested that perhaps I should engage the admiral in conversation. <laughs> Having done that for many years, you know, I'm not quite sure whether we should embark there. But I thought it might be interesting. You know, with all that humor and wit. There were some very insightful observations made about the nature of the maritime domain as far as India is concerned, if you can recall or remember that first set of visuals that he had flashed and spoken about the geography of the oceans and India's own centrality there and linked up all the other issues. And the last slide that we finished about the spectrum that at a national level and at the operational level that become relevant. And somewhere in between embedded, we had that rather tragic visual of Mumbai in November 2008, which I believe would be of extreme relevance. In the last few occasions that I've come to Mumbai, you know, we've had different groups and you see this concern. So what I thought I would do is to actually neither attempt a critique or be a discussant or engage the Admiral in conversation, but perhaps to encourage you, you know, considering that you have sat quietly with not a single cell phone ringing for 72 minutes, that's quite, you know, remarkable, that you might want to actually share your thoughts and your observations and we'll request him at an appropriate point to respond so that it becomes a little more interactive. What I would do is to urge you to identify yourself and if you have a specific question that would be appropriate and otherwise we can have a discussion as it were. So what I will do is, yes, sir, I'll recognize you first at the back and then, Mr. Bhaskar, you. Yeah. The Sri Lankan Navy uh, has been attacking Indian fishermen uh, in the south. Uh, does that come under, you know, maritime security and under the ambit of uh, uh, India protecting its interests or its citizens? And the question that I would like to ask you is whether it is the cabinet, the secretaries who do the thinking for you, or do you do the thinking for them? I think it's the other way around. Recruitment at a higher level is directly or, con or indirectly controlled by the, by the politicians, by the establishment. Uh, does that affect independent thinking of the defense services? That was the second question, which was a corollary to the first. You were accused? Uh, this uh, Kassab theory that uh, uh, our uh, admiral says that we have got 32 kilometer range which is, uh, which is the, with the Indian police or the states at this thing. So there seems to be some 
can we have some sort of uh, both join hands in this area so that we can effectively uh, cover that area? Um, a large ship, you uh, explained to us how it could come and, uh, and ground itself at Juhu Beach. What would happen if the same thing happened in the US of America? Okay, let me go backwards. Um, large ship, what would happen in the United States of America? Let me explain two things to you. The United States of America spends literally billions of dollars on homeland security. Every single day, hundreds of tons of cocaine arrive from South America through the, uh, into Florida in a variety of means, including small submarines. Second, insofar as India is concerned, let's take a comparison with the land borders. We have fenced our land borders. There's a physical fence from end to end. And yet every day you know, and I know, that people cross over across these fenced borders. Now at sea, much as we may try, we are not able to put fences, nor should you, and nor physically, technically can you. What you can do is make sure that your processes of registration, of monitoring, of, active, of reduction of the laissez-faire that applies currently can be done. That brings me to, so that's, first of all, the United States of America, exactly the same thing happens all the time. That brings me, therefore, to the question which was asked about um, this business of whose turf it is. I didn't want to say whose turf it is. Uh, that was not the intent. In any case, since 26 uh, of November, uh, 20, the, the, the events of 2611, we have had a substantial amount of improvement, very significant, in the synergy between the police, the customs, immigration, the Coast Guard, the ports, and the Navy. So are we there yet? Of course not. But are we much ahead from where we were? Of course we are. What does that mean when we say that this is your turf? What it means is that it is our job to provide the training, the capacity, the capability to the next echelon and then walk out of that eventually. That's what we need to do. And that investment is indeed being done. Is it simple? Of course it's not simple because there are different states which have different sensitivities in terms of sharing of information. People don't share information easily. It's just the nature of things. So a lot of time is spent and a lot of investment has been made in creating instruments of synergy. When we created the Joint Operations Center in Bombay, it was a joint, like an armpit is a joint. There was nobody there. Then we spent one where you are sitting inside a polythene bag and all the bad guys are outside. That will never happen. So in case you think that if you give us more money or more ships or more uh, radars, something like that will happen, it will not. What will happen is that the chances of something going through will reduce dramatically. We don't need the polythene bag issue. I have tried to show you how limited a radar is actually. You know how many, at any given point in time, there are upwards of 400 to 500 fishing vessels at sea. You put on your radar, you've got a 16-inch scan, there are 600 entities on it. Okay? Now you want to get somebody, will come up with a technical solution that will get processed video. That means you will put a symbol and you will have some alphanumeric. Four alphanumerics and one symbol, 600, 400 contacts to start with, now multiply by five. Now you've got 2,000. The problems of Technical solutions are difficult. Okay. The third issue, does the uh, cabinet do its thinking for us or do we do our thinking for it? Actually, the answer is uh, both think extremely well. Uh, the cabinet secretariat is not something to be sneezed at. They are not a bunch of um, nitwits. They are extremely, extremely well read, extremely well intentioned, but you can never have domain expertise in everything. I'm a domain expert, I hope, of some, some uh, 
degree in, say, maritime security and maritime affairs and, and in strategy. But I'm not a domain expert in building bridges or in uh, determining traffic flows uh, in Delhi's <coughs> metropolitan area. You need different domain expertises. So what the cabinet tends to do and what government tends to do is gather the experts that they can and then hope that the experts are capable of articulating clearly. What do we lack? We actually lack evangelists. We do not have enough evangelists in our country. We don't have enough. Either we've got speakers like you've got a music system and it has speakers. You know, those speakers don't know what they speak. The, they just speak. The job of speakers is to speak. Or we have people who are really brilliant but who can't say a thing. So what we need is to encourage debate, encourage articulation across civil society, across the government, across both, which is why I'm here uh, willingly to be able to expose you to some of the thoughts that we have, hoping, as Commodore Baska said, that you will come up with some thoughts and we say, wow, why didn't I think of that? And many times we do. Uh, is the Sri Lankan Navy. Now this is a, uh, this is a question which you must, uh, I, I will try and uh, skate skate on because I'm aware it's thin ice here. Remember that the geopolitical entities of our world are defined by borders. If you do not respect borders, then you must expect trouble. We have lots and lots of fishermen every day being captured by Pakistani maritime security agency ships because they are in search of the red snapper of Lalpari, which is in abundance of Karachi. So when you go to a fancy restaurant and say, I'll have red snapper, the chances are that every red snapper you are having equals one fisherman who is rotting away in Pakistani jails. But why are they doing that? They're going there because we have interests in our country that are running inimically to our security understandings. In Sri Lanka, in the area between, in the Park Bay, there is a maritime boundary. You may disagree with it. When nation states disagree upon their boundaries, nation states exist, sir, in a state of anarchy. You cannot go to mummy and say, wo mar hai mujhe. Nation states are nation states, they are sovereign. So when one nation state and another nation state agree on a boundary, they need to respect it. If you do not agree with that, then you exercise diplomacy. If diplomacy fails, then you exercise sovereign power, which is what the armed forces are about. But we do not disagree with Sri Lanka. We have no state-on-state -state disagreement as to where the border is. But your question is particularly valid in another field, and I want to emphasize that. Can I just stand up? I can't see you and you can't see me. Let me just stand up for a second. What you need to do is invest in fish aggregating devices. That means fishermen don't give a toss about what boundary you formed. Because the fishermen chase the fish and we are unable to bring the fish to our discussion, to our meetings. We can bring everything else, fish, but you can. What you do is you put a fish aggregating device as they do in half of, I, I did three years in Mauritius. This is a classic way of doing it. You put a device, it attracts fish, never mind the technical details right now. It has, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Dan boy, that means it's a, it's a boy, a spar, and it's got very thin uh, bronze discs, like the ones you see when bands play and that chap clashes the cymbals together, like that. And they gl the sunlight glints off them and hits the water. The ones which are underwater, they touch each other and they make underwater sound. The fish get attracted, the fish go there. We, they, they pass this information on to the fishing community of each area because fishing is a highly territorial activity. And they say, your, fish are, your fishing uh, uh, aggregating device is over here for your village. Please go there, please catch fish. So if you put your fish aggregating device or some such solution, that means you will attract the fish. When you attract the fish, the fishermen will go there. Then we might have Sri Lanka objecting to uh, our shooting up their chaps. But at the moment, of course, it's a matter of security. Of course, Indians have a right 
but it's difficult for me as a private citizen to exercise my rights when I'm sitting in your house. That is difficult. So to that extent, um, the fishing, fishing community and the problems that they are facing need serious addressal through a large amount of educational programs. That's what is essential, apart from technology. I had a little bit about this fishing bit. Uh, we recently had an international seminar on uh, fishing in which uh, this precise aspect about uh, the problems being faced by the Sri Lankan fishermen and the Indian fishermen in the southern India uh, were addressed. And uh, the report of this, um, of course, we formulated a very voluminous and I presume uh, path breaking. Uh, uh, report to the MEA on this, but a more concise one is available on the ORF website. So in case uh, you are keen, you can uh, go through it. And I think it makes uh, some uh, very uh, uh, helpful suggestions on both sides. And as far as I know, it's being taken up by both the Sri Lankans as well as the Indian, uh, Indians through the MEA. Thank you of the Indian National Ship Owners Association. Uh, in your presentation, you spoke about economic competitiveness. Uh, I'd like you to, I'd like to know more about what you think about economic competitiveness, what India needs to do, uh, especially in respect of the growth of the merchant navy and the, uh, the merchant flag uh, vessels and uh, policies that can help the growth of uh, merchant flag vessels, especially when you're looking at energy-related cargo such as, you know, crude oil and LNG, sir. LNG, too. Journalist with Min newspaper. Uh, sub editor may, may or may not kiss at both cheeks. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is about uh, you in one, in, it's an enlightening presentation where you said about the pirates and you, uh, you know, discuss the issues. But is a, what is the way out? You said 8% is the total export cargo carried by Indian, uh, Indian companies. I don't, I, I want import and export, international trade. So I wonder, you know, in, in near future it will be 0.8% because of the, you know, current uh, cost and piracy, which is very close. I don't think that will be in sea. Maybe it will be la land also. What is the way out? One is that. Second question is, after 9-11, we never, you know, saw any, you know, uh, like, uh, disastrous thing in the U.S. So is it, why it is happening in India? Is it because of the absence of NAD grid kind of stuff? Sorry, absence of? NAD grid kind of. Thank you. Uh, Radha from ORF. Uh, this is a question which I asked uh, Dr. Ghosh earlier in the evening. I'd like to know your views on this, Admiral. What must come first? OVL's bidding for oil blocks in the South China Sea or the Navy's preparedness to protect uh, OVL's interests? The problem of piracy is being addressed in its symptomatic level. That means we are addressing the symptoms of piracy. In Somalia, piracy, if you want to address piracy in the long term, you must address piracy uh, insofar as Somalia and its governance is concerned. That is a minefield which few countries wish to enter. The problems of Somalia are in Somalia. Pirates exist today because of a certain number of things that happened. One, most critically one was that large European nation fishing fleets, not national fishing fleets, just fishing fleets from certain countries, ended up poaching substantially in the waters of Somalia, thereby denying Somali traditional fishermen their ability to earn a wage. Somali fishermen fought this and re in the fighting captured a few of these trawlers and then realized that this business of capturing vessels and holding them for ransom is a good idea. It pays dividends. As soon as a few years of piracy have occurred, now I understand that there is actually an unofficial piracy uh, uh, bourse running and you can buy shares in piracy. Um, so the way out, the real way out is that. Uh, however, that is not something that organs of state like the Navy can uh, obviously do. Our job is to continue to protect that. But the question about 8% of India's foreign trade being carried on Indian bottoms as opposed to our desired 70 or 80% is nothing to do with piracy. Nothing at all. It is to do with the economics 
of registration of ships and the um, and the uh, difficulties that harsh regimes or state-based regimes impose in making sure that the ships that are registered under their flag are safe. So when countries or entities actually just use the register for uh, a cheap flag uh, issue, then you will have many more flags of convenience carrying Indian cargo. There's a real problem on both sides. Okay. Next issue was with regard to the Navy's preparedness and uh, Radha's question whether the chicken should come first or the egg. Flag and trade will always follow one another. First, there, will be, there has to be a recognition by the government that there is significant interest by way of money. That means uh, Admiral Shankar's phone has been placed there. That recognition must come. Then there must be willingness to be able to do something about that. Uh, so I think that the answer is that OVL must first discover something, and which it is doing, of course. And then it, the government must understand that that represents a huge amount of interest. And therefore, the government must seek means and ways to preserve, promote, and protect that interest. These need not be limited to the application of military power at all. It could be that uh, the mandarins of uh, South Bloc vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, in terms of the MEA, sort it all out. Excellent. Hanuman could come and sort it out. That's also fine. It's unlikely, but it's fine. Uh, if none of that happens, then we must be able to use, you see, I said this uh, right in the beginning, you must be able to use hard power. You must know how to use it. You must not end up in um, a belligerent action when you let me give you one, one uh, clear answer. Look, all over, the, all over the world, when there is a crisis which is developing, maritime powers send their navies first. Because navies are hugely calibratable instruments. They can withdraw without any loss of face. Then, if the navy's thing is, needs to be buttressed, they send an air force. And only last do you send the army, because the army is not calibratable. Either the army is in, or it's not. We must be the only power in the world which first sends the army, then sends the Air Force, then worries about the Navy. So either we know something that the world doesn't know, <laughs> or there's some other option. Uh, in terms of economic competitiveness, I think that this is a very substantial uh, question. And it starts from uh, your ability to actually generate the trade. You know, it, it, is, it is a enormous question tied up to the policies for safety, the policies for security, and the policies by which you actually carry cargo. Insofar as India is concerned, critical cargo, that is oil and gas, is by and large being carried on Indian flag vessels. However, the Indian industry, shipping industry, had zero interest in investing money in LPG carriers about five years ago. If I'm not wrong, we had at that point in time. Sir, I must, I must disagree with you on that. The government of India policy never allowed Indian shipping to invest in that. Exactly, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. So, so neither the industry did not want it. Fair enough. So not, once again, it's a chicken and egg business. If we had, so we, at one point in time, only a few years ago, if I remember correctly, we were importing large amounts of oil on SPIC, uh, super, ta super uh, tankers. We aren't doing that anymore or we are doing it to a much lesser degree. But our shipping, our size of our shipping, if you want India to grow at the rate of 8%, I mean, there's something, somebody's living in La La Land. Either if we want to grow at 8%, your multimodal transport, your port handling efficiencies, the number of ports, and the number of ships has to rise in geometric progression. This is not happening. So as a result, I cannot understand how we are going to grow at 8%. And the answer seems to be, more and more from my daughter's generation that we'll go into services. And you can't go into services indefinitely. You need to manufacture something. And you need to get some real commodities. OK, I'm in this very happy position now of trying to get all of you to make your comments and observations. And Without an answer from you. No, Admiral Chauhan has a great reputation that not only does he have a very high rate of velocity in terms of being able to articulate, 
there's also an intelligence quotient that he brings to bear. So I shall watch this with some interest as to how he'll manage. I'll take everyone on board now and see how quickly, rapid fire, below you can respond. Neelam, I'll take all of you one by one. of uh, the ORF. Uh, you know, uh, Admiral Chauhan, first of all, congratulations. Uh, this, this is a range uh, of discussion and uh, depth of really complex issues, uh, which uh, was just brilliantly uh, explained to us, except for one part. There was a very complicated math, but I know that Admiral Chauhan is too smart to be looking for uh, that ship Pavit all over the Indian Ocean. I think he's smart enough to know that he and us, we live in Mumbai, and he will actually be looking for it nearer Mumbai or Gujarat or the rest of our coast. So we don't need those uh, hundreds of uh, radar with all those complications. Uh, so tell us how we as Mumbaikers should feel uh, that more and more security measures are being taken for uh, cities like Mumbai, which have been frequent targets and continue to be a target. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is Kavita Ayer. I work with the Indian Express. Uh, my question is also regarding empty pavit. Uh, in this case, while I completely understand and agree that it could not have been spotted while it was uh, several nautical miles away, the fishermen spotted it the night before it landed and uh, they informed the local police station. And this is something we heard and we reported uh, in the subsequent days. Uh, I want to know what was the stock taking exercise later on the failure of responding to uh, the fishermen's warning. So they ob obviously didn't call the Navy, they called the police, but I'm assuming that there's a chain of uh, information that would at some point of time reach the Navy as well. And we heard the following day only from the Naval PRO, and that was almost close to noon. Okay, listen, can I just interview briefly and say that this is not quite a press conference. You know, we are doing this under the AGs of the ORF, which is a think tank. So I just want to suggest that if we haven't already stated this so explicitly, that any kind of reference in the media should be cleared with the Admiral personally, so that there is no misunderstanding. I hope that's okay with you, Dhawan. And otherwise, this would be seen really as a track two kind of a interaction that would also allow Admiral Chauhan to respond in the appropriate manner. Yes, sir, you've been waiting. Sir, my name is Ashish. I'm a project designer with the Nataraja Foundation. I've designed something called the Mumbai Mega Project. Now, this project has got a particular... Uh, I've, I've seen the channel that the Navy has in the... Uh, in the, the, the channel that the Navy has, and I find it's very narrow. So, among when I designed the project, I provided four billion dollars to move the Navy, the entire naval base, out of Mumbai to a location around 100 kilometers south, and it'll be a big one. It'll be a big one on the open sea. I mean, how uh, is the Navy? Would be Navy would be interested in uh, moving south? And what are your uh, think thoughts on this? Uh. Good evening, sir. I'm Swati Gadam. I'm an environmental engineer. I would like to know what is the role being played by the Indian Navy for the protection of the marine environment. Thank you. Can I take one more question and then I say no? Sir. Yeah, yeah, sir. I'm Dr. Sahu from uh, Center for African Studies, University of Mumbai. Thank you very much, sir, for for giving so much of time of your presentation on Africa, which is really very important, especially energy issues that you dealt with. Uh, not many people know that almost 20% of oil in the future and still is coming from Africa. And I'm very happy that Indian Navy is now talking beyond Indian Ocean, going to Namibia and all. If 20% if, if and more oil to come from Africa, then one major area would be Gulf of Guinea. Angola, you mentioned, sir, we already are buying from Angola, but also from Nigeria. And we are also investing in other countries like Ghana, and also in Ivory Coast. In that case, we will be very strong. We have to be very strong in Gulf of Guinea. In that connection, do you by chance have a plan? If at all, could you elaborate? Thank you. All right, um, 
Pavit. First, there are oceanic international shipping lanes that ships follow. And you're quite right. You don't have to actually put ships all over the oceanic space, except that if a ship is a derelict, then it isn't following anything. It's following the path that nature allows it to take. Now we have some predictions of how currents and how uh, tide might move, but every ship is affected differently. Different speeds, different uh, um, courses, and when you have a derelict which takes a derelict um, ship which might have been abandoned many thousands of miles away, it is not that the Indian Navy or any Navy in the world is so well established that not a sparrow falls but we know. It isn't like that. And so consequently a nav area warning is issued by that particular ship company saying that my ship has been abandoned. After that, if another input comes in that the ship has been sunk and it is 3,000 miles away, I'm not going to worry. Now, therefore, if the, ship's not, if the ship is not going to follow a predictable path, then the uh, actual answer is yes, you will have to put ships all, all over the place. Now, your question is only shouldn't we put a certain number of ships in a garland around Mumbai or around these areas, something like that. But each ship, you must remember, Ha or any radar that we've got. There's so much noise about being made about the coastal radar chain. When the coastal radar chain comes, you will be able to gather something 20 miles away from your coast, which is pretty good. But when you're, which comes to, brings me to your question. When you know that a ship is 20 miles away and it's a derelict and it's the monsoon, what exactly do you think can be done? We could not fly, no helicopters can be flown. It's not we could not fly. Helicopters cannot be flown. And if they are flown, People who do these daring do tricks on TV, they don't exist in real life. In TV, it's done in a studio. Here, therefore, you cannot do slithering. You cannot embark the ship. Let's assume you could. You really had some terrific chaps, and you took your chances, and the helicopter came, and you land. Then, who will handle the gear on the ship? A, a, a large ship has substantial gear. The ropes are, they're not dhagas. The ropes are, are uh, you know, substantial, 16, 16 uh, centimeter um, thick. They, they weigh a ton and a half. Then there's an anchor, a cable. It's, it's not easy. So what have we done? What do we do? We have put in place a certain series of measures to try and say, we can sink the ship. How do we sink it? Should we fire? Which way should we fire? Should we fire from seawards towards uh, the Banda Sea Link? Would that be a good idea? To fire the other way around, there has to be depth of water. There isn't any depth. Why the PRO couldn't tell you? The police having got an input from the... When the police get an input, see, we have people who drown every monsoon. They drown in marine drive. What happens is that a kid goes into the water, then somebody picks up the phone and dials the em emergency number that you have. The emergency number that you have is generally the police control room. Then the police responds to the, to the most uh, appropriate responder. Normally, the first reaction of any police is to inform the fire brigade. Then the fire brigade comes, allowing, uh, assuming the traffic allows the fire brigade to come. Then the fire brigade comes and he takes an assessment of the situation. Then he informs the Coast Guard. Then the Coast Guard launches something. In other words, in the, in the event that you are discussing, all this chain worked, but it takes time. Now, what is the stock taking that has been done? How do we cut down the time? When we have a monsoon period every year, we should be prepared, isn't it? We are prepared. We have units non-stop positioned all around the Bombay uh, coastline. So does the Coast Guard. But all around the Bombay coastline is not every inch. We don't have those many people. So a lot of effort is being made to synergize activities between the police, the fire brigade, the customs, the immigration, and us, which is what the joint operation centers are all about. They don't only deal with terrorists, though that's their primary job. They will deal, as they mature, it will get better and better and better. But are we there yet? No. Will we ever be there? No. It will always be an effort to catch up to the disaster that might occur. That's more than one minute. Uh, Mumbai mega project. Move the Navy out of Mumbai. This is tantamount to saying, as we say sometimes, that the ports are uh, 
dangerous, they are difficult to keep open in war, let's close the ports. You can't throw, you will end up throwing away the baby with the bathwater. We already have a huge port and a huge base facility coming up in Karwar. We are trying to decongest Mumbai, but we are not abandoning Mumbai. You cannot abandon the city as a navy. So let me again explain. What happens is ships don't just stand there indefinitely ready to go. Ships like cars, like motorcycles, like everything else require periodic maintenance. The biggest enemy we face outside of these coastal security things is rust. You take metal and you want to put it in brine. You know, you must have fallen on your head when you were very little. But yet, that's what we do. Brine, salt water, rust. So therefore, maintenance effort on a ship is enormous and you need industry around it. The problem we are facing in Karwar, amongst the many problems, one of them is that Karwar doesn't have any industrial base around it. So when we position Vikramaditya with 3,000 men, uh, you require some infrastructure. That infrastructure is n not found easily outside the metros. Okay. Um, the role being played by the Indian Navy in environment. The Indian Navy is a lead player in environment. And if you are an environment journalist or an environment NGO member, uh, I obviously am, we have obviously goofed it somewhere because you don't know. The lead players in environment, in coastal environment in the city of Mumbai are the Indian Coast Guard and the Indian Navy in that order. When you have MV Chitra colliding with uh, Khalija, it is the Indian Navy that comes to hand. It is the Coast Guard which brings out stuff. Bombay Port Trust is seldom able to generate the amount of wherewithal that it needs to because the calamity is large. When you have oil spills which take place, Every single, you know, we have a promenade running past the U.S. club. Every Sunday, Indian naval sailors go and clean up that area. It's an idiot activity because the, the refuse keeps coming in from the north of the city. It comes to us. We pick it up. We tell our chaps, you're doing a great job. Next morning, it's back again. But that's what we do. Okay. Um, that's not, I don't mean this in a, in a belligerent manner. I just mean that... Uh, Yes, we are strongly into environmental uh, activity. We do not pollute. Um, that is, no, Gulf of Guinea, uh, Africa. West coast of, the west coast of Africa, um, Bonnie Light and all the distillates that can come out of Nigeria uh, are obviously areas of interest. We do not have the reach, we don't have the wherewithal yet to concentrate upon these areas. Also. Uh, we are not importing direct quantities. We are doing a lot of equity trading there. Whereas in, in Vietnam, for example, we are picking up actuals or in um, many of the other places we are in the, in the Persian Gulf area. And on East, in the East African coast is where we are concentrating. Will we be an Atlantic power? I don't know. If you pay your taxes, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I only have one more person, you know, in with two. So I really want to give everyone a chance and stay within 7.30. So if you could make quick questions and Thank I'll you very much, sir. Uh, I have a question about how the Navy is used to project power. Um, as we've been discussing uh, with this uh, incident about abandoned ships uh, being left in the Arabian Sea, I think this points to a larger perception gap between how we perceive ourselves or at least how the Indian Navy perceives uh, the Arabian Sea as a zone of its control uh, or in its patrol area. But the fact of the matter is uh, India, the west coast of India is the world center of the ship breaking industry. Uh, ships are sent here from all over the world every year for the sole purpose of uh, destruction. Um, very toxic process and all the things that go with it. But uh, uh, this uh, incident with MV Pavit uh, sort of highlights a disturbing trend where uh, the ship was abandoned, I believe, of the coast of Oman it was uh, and just left to flounder in this ocean for as long as it did. Uh, is there any way that the Navy can, obviously without seeming belligerent, uh, come across as a, a power not to be trifled with in this area? Uh, in the sense of, I'll refer you to this one, MV Pavit incident. There was another one where a ship was sent to the uh, ship breaking yards in Gujarat, um, but without telling everyone, they had loaded some 30 tons of to toxic waste on it as well. So things like that, which uh, people have been doing because they can get away with, can we reverse that by changing perception somehow? 
its sea trials of uh, aircraft carrier uh, what is our response and what, what would be the china's strategy uh, is it in the response to uh, the ch uh, challenges faced by uh, vietnam and other countries to china or uh, towards indian ocean and also uh, china's role uh, recently in the reports about uh, land borders uh, with in uh, help to pakistan uh, the second question is, yeah, uh, being brief, just uh, second question is, we are, uh, recently we have been uh, engaged in anti-piracy activity. Is it uh, causing uh, too much burden of, uh, on Indian Navy uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, focus on our main activities uh, other than piracy? The question is very similar to the first one, that is, uh, after the incident of, uh, incident of 2008, uh, Kassab and M.T. Pawit. Do you think India is growing sea blind on the western coast? Because ships and people just coming in. Actually, I don't mind. I will intervene here and I have maybe spare Admiral Chauhan having to repeat this. I don't think we should mix up the issues. You know, the fact that you have derelict ships landing up on the Indian west coast is not a reflection on the lack of ability of power projection by the Indian Navy. So I think we are mixing too many disparate issues. So if I may just quarantine that because I do want to bring this to a close within the time available that Mr. Dhawal had suggested. Let me sort of, you know, lead on from here. You know, the subject that we had requested the Admiral to speak on was about India's maritime security and the Navy's transformational role. And I think since you had mentioned Kasab, I'd like to suggest that as far as Delhi is concerned, if India's gaze or India's national view is being mediated from Delhi, it is true that Delhi has traditionally been sea blind. And this is something which is historical. It's a function of both geography and history. So India is not a nation that has been endowed with what you might call as a maritime empathy. Now that is, as I said, part of the DNA. Now, but at the same time, quite tragically, I would say that after Mumbai 2008, perhaps Delhi has become more cognizant of the maritime dimension and it took the enormity of Mumbai to make the country aware of the vulnerability and I think a very interesting observation that Admiral Chauhan had made in the course of his slides was about the fact that your coastline is not synonymous with the maritime border and if you extend this further and talk about India's maritime interest which is another very I would say appropriate uh, concept that he introduced by a group like this from Mumbai which is one, a statement of fact, that today when we talk about the Indian national interest, and again, I think Admiral Chauhan showed us a very useful slide, and there should be no doubts about that, that when you hear the Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, speak now, or you have heard previous Prime Ministers, if there is one core objective, you know, and the Indian state has constantly tried to define that, to articulate it, it has been the well-being of the people. How do you improve the socio-economic indicators, the human security? That ultimately is the primary responsibility when we talk about national security. And all other things fall into place. Even if you go through the kind of trauma that we did in 1962, I mean, today is October 21st and yesterday was October 20th. So if you recall what happened 49 years ago, there are threats, there are challenges which come in different shapes and sizes, but there is an abiding interest. And it's interesting that if you see this in the long cycle of history, what the Constitution of India says about the well-being and the people actually can be taken back about 3,000 years and say that you find this even in the Arthashastra. If Chanakya and Kautilya talk about Yoga Kshema, I mean, there is an unbroken continuum in terms of the responsibilities that devolve upon rulers and those who are guiding the larger fortunes of states and societies. Why I'm bringing that up is to say that, you know, there is a continuum. In that continuum, again, I'm going back to one of the slides that uh, Bidu Chauhan had shown, which is how did India relate to the ocean? He spoke about soft power, he spoke about culture, he spoke about trade. And I think that is one of the aspects that needs to be burnished again, that when he showed that first slide which spoke about the progressive decline of, or not decline, but the shrinking of India's contribution to global wealth from first century, coming down to where we are almost 2,000 years later, it is a combination of factors. The context is progressively changing. It's dynamic. And for India, the fact that you were where we were in the first century was, again, going back to your observation, sir, is the linkage between prosperity and the ocean. That, I think, is the rhythm that we need to really remind ourselves about. 
and regrettably, I've said this in Delhi, so I'm repeating what I said in Bombay, that the apex in Delhi, for a variety of reasons, you know, has not been able to, I think, make that appreciation and then tease out the appropriate national policies, mostly for redressal, some to advance. And one, you know, when I want to give this example about the maritime security of India and the fact that we need various kinds of transformations, when the Joint War Committee, you know, when I just want to make this point about A, to say that there is a linkage between India's security and the maritime domain is a truism. When you have chapter and verse, you read Discovery of India, you will find the same things being repeated in every speech that a minister gives on the subject. Is there a tangible component? Is it only Mumbai 2008? No, there is more. And this is what, you know, when we try to draw attention in Delhi to say that on January 1st, 2011, the Joint War Committee in London designates areas up to 75 degrees east longitude as risk prone. So starting Jan 2, the Indian taxpayer is paying a higher amount for every ship that has come to an Indian port. And I requested, I think you, madam, you know, you gave us some figures in the last meeting. It is a hemorrhaging. But it took Delhi a very long time to make this connection. And that is what I mean by saying that the lack of empathy as far as the maritime domain is concerned, and even as recently as last week, I know that when there were some deliberations, this point came up again. But the reality is, Jan 1, we were on October 15 when we had that meeting, almost nine and a half months later, the GOI, the Indian state, has not been able to redress that. Please correct me if I'm wrong. We are still in the same status. And that is where I think, you know, we need to have greater awareness about these linkages and I believe it's in that context that the effort being made by the ORF or people like you who have taken the trouble to come and spend a couple of hours becomes very active because we need to constantly push the envelope. I'm not suggesting that the maritime domain should really have the Anna Hazare kind of, you know, shall we say contour to it, but definitely in a progressive way there has to be a greater awareness and this is where I think the transformational role that has been spoken about as far as the Navy is concerned has also got structural constraints, which is again, if you recall your figures very broadly, since I spoke about October 1962, the orientation of the Indian state in terms of its military preparedness has now got into fixed stovepipes, and they're almost being cemented, meaning that we're finding it very difficult to change them. If you look at it in broad figures, you know, back of the envelope, you have a defense expenditure, which is say X rupees. Out of that, willy-nilly, 0.56 to 0.61 percent goes to the Indian Army, depending on which decade you look at. 0.24 to 0.27 goes to the Indian Air Force. And then there is a bandwidth of 0.12 to 0.16, 0.17, which goes to the Indian Navy. And then you have a little residue that goes to the R&D and so on. Now, we have reached a situation where this has become, as I said, very difficult to touch the fiscal patterns. And any transformation that you speak about the software, the intellectual, you know, whatever be the kind of contribution that the Navy makes institutionally to the national grid can only come into effect when you have a fair amount of sustained material support. That in turn cannot happen unless somebody has the confidence to say, hey guys, we need to rewire this. You know, we can't go along with this with 0.56 and 0.26 and 0.16, whatever is happening. So it's only in the interest of time. Believe me, Admiral Chauhan, having known him over the years as a man who knows too much, on a range of subjects. So I'm sure that if there is time, we would be able to engage with him and talk about these issues. But may I, with your permission, I will bring it to a close now because of your time constraints. Otherwise, you know, we would uh, be detaining some members of the audience. So I would request you to come and do the honors and I shall forego the opportunity of doing this great critique, um, you know, shall we say, being a discussion to Admiral Chauhan's brilliant presentation. <laughs> When my colleague uh, Radha Vishwanathan said that she'll try and bring uh, Admiral Pradeep Chauhan to deliver a public lecture at ORF, I personally brush it aside uh, saying that this was one of those things like many of us come up with in a rush of excitement. Um, men in uniform who hold positions of such high importance uh, with respect to national security don't normally talk on public forums is what I thought. Uh, but I'm so glad that my thoughts were 
proven totally baseless and completely wrong, and how? Um, so friends, Observer Research Foundation expresses its deepest gratitude to Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, first for readily agreeing to deliver this talk, and second for so candidly sharing his views with all of us. And without your off-the-cuff remarks, sir, it would have been merely educational, but this was more infotainment, so thank you so much for it. <laughs> So we wish you good luck for the remaining years of your service with the Indian Navy and beyond. I thank Commander Ashwin for closely coordinating uh, with Radha and me for this possible, uh, to make this event possible. And Komodo Bhaskar, who uh, agreed to specially fly in from Delhi to spend less than 12 hours in Mumbai just to chair this session, deserve a special thanks. Uh, I must tell you, friends, uh, that Komodo Bhaskar arrived in Mumbai at 3 p.m and he's scheduled to take a return flight to Delhi uh, in the wee hours of the morning, just to ensure that he's in Delhi tomorrow for a, for a very important meeting that he used to attend. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here despite a very tight schedule. Uh, many thanks also to one very extremely privileged guest that we have in our midst, uh, Ambassador Neelam Dev, the director of Gateway House, for gracing our office on this occasion. Uh, to all of you friends, uh, a heartfelt thanks for turning up to attend this event on our working afternoon. And many thanks also to friends from the media who showed a great enthusiasm in covering this event. And uh, uh, your word of caution was, I think, very well taken. Thank you, sir. Uh, on your way out, please feel free to pick up copies of some of ORS reports and publications that might be of, of your interest. Thank you very much. I just have one request. I also and, and, and so before, before I forget, I think I must ask my colleagues to present a, a token of our appreciation to Commodore Bhaskar and to Admiral Chauhan. And can we do an exchange of gifts? May I, on <laughs> behalf of our foundation, <laughs> Havel, Thank you very much. give you a set? My and pleasure. If the media members can stay back for a couple of minutes, I just want to talk to you all. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to say something. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, um, I have a plea. It is not often that we come and have an engagement while we are still in service with the media. So my plea is this. This was meant to be a discussion at the strategic level. Uh, if you write um, articles which are more sensational than the government of India appreciates, then we will have a new chief of staff. 